In this video, I'm gonna explain everything there is to know about the Google product reviews update. We're gonna dig into exactly what steps you need to take to upgrade your existing content in order to benefit from this massive change. My name is Matt Diggity. I'm the founder of Diggity Marketing, LeadSpring, and the Affiliate Lab. I make a full-time living off of ranking affiliate review content, and I have a lot to say about this update. So get your notepad handy, because we have a lot to talk about. On April 8th, Google announced the release of the Google product reviews update which is designed to reward product review content that provides in-depth research. This is opposed to penalizing content that doesn't meet these standards, which is an important point that I'm gonna address later. The length of the update rollout is two weeks, according to search liaison Danny Sullivan. So what types of sites does this affect? Any type of site that produces product review content, but the most common type of site like this would be an affiliate site. But that doesn't exclude other types of sites that have a different primary goal, but affiliate review content on the side, like the New York Times wire cutter section, or Forbes, the worldwide authority on pillows, as we all know. What constitutes product review content? According to Danny Sullivan, it's any type of product review, whether it be a single product review, like a review of ExpressVPN, or a review roundup that covers the best VPN services. Now, what does this update attempt to do and how does it affect your rankings? In this post, Google says that the Google product reviews update is meant to reward content that shares in-depth research. And that's opposed to summarizing content that you can find on the product sales page of the manufacturers. Now, if you read between the lines, we knew this was coming. I actually covered this already in my video about the December 2020 core algorithm update. Now Google elaborates more when they highlight the need for insightful analysis, original research, which is written by experts or enthusiasts. Now is that last part a statement about EAT detection? I don't think so, and I'll explain why soon. Now before I jump into solutions, if you have a site that you think has gotten hit by this, it's not so much that you've gotten penalized, but your competitors have been rewarded. In this article by Search Engine Land, they say just as much. And by doing a little bit of logical gymnastics, I've come to the conclusion that this isn't an update that's site-wide and that can affect your entire website. It should only be affecting your review content pages and it shouldn't be touching your informational content pieces. If Google isn't penalizing any content, but only rewarding exceptional product review content, then we can infer that there should be no movement for informational type keywords like does VPN slow down internet or what are the benefits of juicing. Now, even if you're not doing product reviews in your content right now, you still need to pay attention to this. This may spread into service reviews as well. Okay, so Google wants original research. They want experts writing the content. They want demonstrations of the product. Do you need to go out and order every single protein powder you're reviewing and then get Arnold Schwarzenegger to eat them all and write about them? I don't think so. Let's take a look at the Google post on this update and pick it apart. And let's figure out a feasible way to press forward with affiliate marketing. But before I do that, can I ask if you would press that like button? Pressing the like button is like the YouTube equivalent of letting the search gods know that content is good. It's also free, takes 0.1 seconds of your time depending on your reaction speed, and makes me feel good. Thanks. Google put out this post about the update, which has an awesome section here that provides a list of questions you can ask yourself to determine if your content is in line with the expectations of this update. Let's go through it. And I'd just like to say, it's awesome that they gave this to webmasters. Everybody who's watching this needs to update their writer content guidelines to include these bullet points that I'm about to discuss. Bullet point number one asks, does your review express expert knowledge about products where appropriate? This is a pretty vague question because it doesn't really define what is meant by expert. According to dictionary.com, we can interpret expert to mean someone who has more knowledge than a majority of people on a subject, or in our case, product. Most people would only know about a product from the product sales page itself. So let's assume everything on this ExpressVPN FAQ page to be common knowledge, not expert knowledge. How can you go above and beyond this? First, you can straight up buy ExpressVPN and set up a simulation environment looking at stuff like the impact on upload and download speeds. But maybe not all that is necessary. You could compare ExpressVPN versus NordVPN in an objective review, which I guarantee you're not gonna find on the product page. Also, let's think, what do people use VPNs for? A lot of people use VPNs to watch streaming services in non-US countries. So you could come up with a table of download speeds using a VPN in various countries. Or how about analyzing their support response time? Send them a technical question via their contact form and see how long it takes for them to reply. That data point in your review takes 10 seconds to collect. Thinking of stuff like this is super easy. Just go to Reddit and you'll find a bajillion things to analyze and put in your product reviews. And even if you're not reviewing the product yourself, if you collect dozens of different data points on a product, compare their validity, and then give your opinion, aren't you at least somewhat 
somewhat of an expert or at least an enthusiast. The next bullet point says that you need to show what the product is like physically or how it is used beyond what you can find on the manufacturer's site. I think the key word here is show. But how can you physically show that you've used a product other than actually buying it? Or if you've even bought a product like a VPN, how do you even prove that you own it? What this means to me is having unique images. We have to think about how Google, an algorithm, would detect this. Use unique images of the protein powder you're reviewing, rather than the stock images on the manufacturer's site. Photoshop is your friend. Or screenshots of the user interface of the product. The next bullet point says you should provide quantitative measurements on how a product measures up based on different criteria. You should be doing this anyways. Too often do I see reviews that don't have any comparison criteria. If we use the example of protein powder, let's say you're reading a roundup of the best whey protein powder. If they're simply ranking them 1 to 10 for no apparent reason at all, should you trust them? We should be looking at criteria like price, taste, quality ingredients, and digestibility. Like I said, you should be doing this already in your content. You'll be converting a lot better as well. The next bullet point says you should explain what sets a product apart from its competitors. This right here is the ultimate reason why product review content is even so popular on the internet in the first place. The sales pages of the manufacturers are not gonna be unbiased when it comes to showing how they're stacking up against the competition. Delivering this knowledge well should be your entire goal when you're writing product reviews. This is super easy to do with the comparison table in a review roundup, like this awesome table done by Code and WP for the best WordPress host. But this should happen even in your single product reviews as well, which is a good segue to the next bullet point, which says you should cover comparable products and even explain which products are best for certain situations. This means you can't just sell, sell, sell when you're doing your single product reviews. You have to highlight some of the pros and some of the cons. One thing we do in our single product reviews is we also mention our other reviews and we provide links for them so the reader can check those out as well. We even provide links to our comparison pieces, such as comparing ExpressVPN versus NordVPN. And going back to what they said about offering different products in certain situations, this likely means that we need to be breaking down our Roundup reviews into subsections, like I did in my article about the best web hosting for SEOs. Okay, we talked about this one before. You can't just sell a product. You have to talk about the drawbacks as well. You can't just highlight the pros. You need to highlight the cons. You want to do this anyways. It makes your reviews more believable and you convert better. This one is more interesting. You should describe the evolution of a product and how it's improved over time. This can be valuable to readers to know that the product is being maintained and developed over time. Now this one definitely takes some research. Even if you look at the release notes for ExpressVPN, it's pretty much useless. But at least you can know how often they release updates, which is better than most product review content will do. You're already ahead of the game. But a quick little email like this can be sent in 10 seconds that can get you some solid information for your review post. This one is interesting. Kind of a repeat from the categories of performance from before, but they gave a nice example. A car review should should rate key factors such as fuel economy, safety, etc. in its product reviews. Again, you should be doing this anyways. And it doesn't take too long to think of what should be the key criteria. Not to sound like a D-bag, but if you don't know what the key criteria should be for a washing machine, you shouldn't be writing reviews on washing machines. The last bullet point says you should talk about product design and how that affects the reader. For example, I prefer cloud-based SEO tools and services because it keeps all the data in the cloud and makes things a lot easier for my team to access projects. And if I were to be comparing Sightbulb versus Screaming Frog, I'd be sure to point that out. So now that we've gone over everything that Google has given us to think about, how can we bring this analysis above and beyond the obvious? First, I'd like to think about this update algorithmically. Algorithmically, how can Google even determine if content is different than the manufacturer's page? Well, they look at the content difference. Are the words, entities, and semantic relationships on the review page different than the product page? The manufacturer's sales page should be full of quote unquote power words and rosy sales sentences like, no matter where you are or what devices you're using, a single ExpressVPN subscription has got you covered. Your review pages should be different. They should be filled with a whole different set of objective words. Words used to objectively describe products. Words like compare and tests and findings. Original reviews would also contain a lot of words like we and I, such as sentences like, I then tested download speeds from Hong Kong. This is where Google's NLP algorithms are going to come into play and they'll start to identify sets of words and corpuses that are going to show up on review pages as opposed to manufacturers pages. But here's another inception level to this. 
Should product reviews differ from each other? Do they not only need to be different than the manufacturer's page, but also from each other as well to be perceived as original? Will we go back into a universe where whoever has the longest content has the advantage just because their chances of having something original in there is higher? We'll have to wait and see. It's going to take a long time for the content world to adjust to this change. But until then, make sure to subscribe for more SEO update videos just like these.